I, I think a lot of it has to do with the time. Yeah. Mid seventies, mm -hmm. an outspoken woman mm -hmm. was shunned. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! You can do it! You can do it! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready? Hello and welcome to another episode of Olympic Fever, the podcast for Olympics fans. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you today? Buongiorno. Buongiorno. I only have I only have seven years. <laughs> Take it one word a day. Exactly. We'll be fluent. <laughs> I'll be ready for you, Milan. You have no idea what's coming. Before we get into the show today, I wanted to mention that our contributor Ben has a project going on Instagram, and you can follow him at Ben at Olympic Fever, B E N A T Olympic Fever on Insta and he has decided to take this book I found on Amazon and it's a book that was made for the 1980 Moscow Olympic Games and it was published before the boycott and it's from Team USA and it's a cookbook with recipes from Olympic hopefuls. So about once a week he tries another recipe and some have been sketchy which I think I, I think there's a recipe we do it's the second one called Cheese Bake Judy. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what it's called. Yeah, it's it's got a lot of white bread. We'll just, we'll just say that. And then there is another recipe for a salad sandwich surprise, which is delicious. It's my new favorite sandwich. I have had it several days in a row. I am out of one of the ingredients right now, but I need to go to the store and get it because it is so tasty. So check Ben out. Yes, I have been I have been watching those and I'm not close enough to come over and try them, though I would mm -hmm. like to. But I always worry when a food has a surprise. In it. <laughs> I know I do, too. But this was surprisingly good. Yeah, the, the recipes have that very 70s flair. I just keep tuning in to see what else he comes up with. And I, as guinea pig tester, will keep you posted. <laughs> I got to tell you about my Coast Sport ticket buying experience. Which, oh, so you yes, won certain tickets in the lottery, right. and then you have to go and actually complete your purchase. No. So this is okay. a different thing. So I have completed my purchase. We have tickets. We've bought them. They are hopefully on their way. Then after the lottery, they did a they had another ticket allotment, or it was leftover tickets that people decided not to buy once they got them into their cart. And this was a first-come, first-served sale, and it was yesterday. And if you were on Twitter, we were going nuts on Twitter with what was happening in the sale. And I went online and logged into my account about 35 minutes before the sale started. And it was just like, well, here's the countdown clock to the sale and you'll be put into the queue. So I was number 4,820. And it took me about an hour and 15 minutes to get to the top of the line. Wow. And sure enough, when I got in, there wasn't much there. And so you'd click on something and it would be gone. And then you'd try, you'd go back and then you'd exclude stuff that was already sold out and you'd see if there were any buttons up. And there was a lot of basketball that came up and I, I don't really want to see basketball, but there was three on three basketball that came up and like, huh? Okay. So I ended up getting some three on three basketball tickets, got them successfully into my cart and then it said, well, you have 45 minutes to check out or you lose these tickets. And I thought, huh, if we all have 45 minutes to check out, maybe people will give up some of these tickets once they see how much stuff costs. So I just for like spent another half an hour refreshing my uh, browser and kept looking because stuff did pop up. Like equestrian would suddenly pop back in and handball would suddenly pop back in and wrestling would pop back in and... I got some equestrian tickets in my cart, but had to give them up because they conflicted with another event we already had tickets for. So that was a bummer. Which but, is probably what a lot of people were doing. They yeah. were putting things in their cart. Oh, but this one is better. So then they would take something else. Yeah, exactly. Out. And then I managed to snag some wrestling tickets. So excited. And then with about 15 minutes to go, I couldn't get anything else. So I and start checking out and... 
I got fairly far in the process and then I went to myself, oh, I should go back and take screenshots of everything. And I don't know if that, I don't think that did anything, but then I went back through the process again. I was putting in my credit card information. Then I got the, the page popped up again and said, no, you have to fill out the boxes with the asterisks. And they were already full with my correct information. So I submitted it again, got the same stuff again, retyped it in. It, I, it didn't take for like two or three times. And then all of a sudden my cart was empty. Oh. I have no idea what happened. I tried to send him a comment because I'm like, well, I know you can't do anything about it because these tickets are now long gone. And then when I tried to send the comment, I got an error message. And they said in the error message, well, hit contact us if you're still having problems. I'm like, well, I'm having problems contacting you. And then it was just like, well, I'm, I'm done. I'm giving up. Oh, um, so CoSport was not doing it for you yesterday. No, clearly. it was tough. It was tough. And then it, it then like what frustrated me was I did end up spending all afternoon on this and I didn't have the time to spend on that because I got work with some deadlines. I'm like, oh, this is not what I really needed to do with my day. But I do have tickets. Otherwise, remember what Ken Hanscom told us. Yes. So I did sign up with the OS Tokyo 2020 tickets site tracker which is os-site-tracker.com. And it does cost 15 euros, which is like 17 bucks. And I have been getting messages from it saying, here's hmm. a batch of tickets that are on sale. They haven't been tickets I could purchase because a lot of them have been in Germany. And then the CoSport Australian site went live today. So I've gotten messages about those tickets. And that's been a little frustrating. But I do, like, the bot works. It's telling me when stuff is available. So, You'll get more tickets. Yeah, exactly. So there will be opportunities. It was interesting. Some people on Twitter, which we I met a lot of people on Twitter yesterday, and we got some followers. So hello and welcome. The one thing that frustrated me was somebody who got in early got opening ceremonies tickets. Wow. And bought extra so they could sell them for a profit. Those people have a special ring in hell. I know. It's that the just, Olympic oh, ring of hell right. where they belong. That is awful. I mean, I know it's not awful, but that makes me mad. It, it made me mad, too, because there are so many people who want to see this. And it's just another way that the Olympics is not for the average fan. Right. In a sense. And Tokyo is doing what they can do to make the tickets affordable. And I, I realize that opening ceremonies is not going to be an affordable ticket because it's a super popular one. Right. And that's fine. But for somebody to say, oh, I got the opportunity to buy extra tickets, so I'm going to, and I'm going to try to rip somebody, you know, force somebody else to pay more so I can make a profit, I don't like that. And there's nothing Tokyo can do. You can't legislate against bad manners. Right. Because so, that's what that is. Right. It's, it's not illegal. It's not immoral. It's just mm -hmm. not very nice. That's correct. So I will say, oh my gosh, the fees on CoSport. Oh, Ticketmaster has nothing on these people. Oh. I would love to hear from people in other countries who don't have to go through CoSport what your fees are like. The three-on-three -three basketball tickets that I was going for, they were $77.62 a ticket. So that was... 8,000 yen. Not too bad. Handling fee, 1552. Each so ticket? Each ticket. So that made the unit price 9315 just for the ticket. And then you had to have an additional fee on top of that, which was currency conversion fee and a merchant service fee of 2.54%. So you're paying because you have to use credit cards and you have to use a visa. So that's that's that fee. So that's, for my whole order, there's a fee for that, and then there's a flat rate shipping fee. Flat rate shipping fee was 35 bucks. Now, the wrestling tickets, the face value of those was 349.31, handling fee of 58.22 per ticket. Wow. Right? Wow. Yeah, right. So, like, the more expensive your ticket is, your handling fee goes up, too. Like, for what? Because they're... More difficult to handle? Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I, Do they the think special they, gloves maybe, for that? Maybe Coastport thinks they need to wrestle the ticket. <laughs> maybe. So then oh. your my flat rate fee for 
all of the cur- currency conversions would have been forty seven thirty, and then the thirty five dollar flat rate shipping fee. And I can tell you, it's now, not costing me with it's- the thirty five dollar flat rate. Is that all the tickets you purchase? Or are you paying that each time for each, each ticket? Each time you per- make a purchase. So okay, it didn't so matter get- that I. It didn't matter that I won tickets in the lottery. I had to pay the thirty five dollars then too. But all the tickets you won in the lottery was one shipping fee. One shipping fee, yes. Okay. So because you know, putting that extra set of tickets in really praises the price of the envelope. Right, but honestly, I would like to see a nice fancy envelope for my thirty-five dollars, please. I want it hand delivered by a nice little, you know, man from Japan who brings it on a silver tray <laughs> and teaches me some Japanese while he's there. It was fun. It was fun to try and it was fun to hang out, but it was just a frustrating experience when it all came down to it. So thank you to everyone on the Twitter feed who was listening and following along. So there are many ways to interact with us online. We are Olim Fever on Twitter and Insta and Olympic Fever Podcast on Facebook. And we also have an Olympic Fever Podcast Facebook group, which is a lot of fun to hang out in. All right, let's get to today's discussion. We are welcoming back our book club coordinator, Claire Natsis, for our talk about Making Waves, My Journey to Winning Olympic Gold and Defeating the East German Doping Program by Shirley Babishaw. Take a listen. Claire, it is so good to have you back on again. I enjoyed this book a lot. I'm glad you did. I found this book to be very interesting. This was this is our second bi- or autobiography, correct? After yes. Lopez yeah. Lamont. This was very different, I yes. must say. It was very different. I, different I, time, <laughs> different sport, different issue. Different personality. Yeah. I, like, I saw on Facebook, uh, in our Facebook group, someone said, oh, you know, I'd be friends with her, you know, because we, we vibe together. And I'm reading this going... No, I don't think we'd be friends. <laughs> I don't think so because, you know, she's just, she's very interesting, you know, it, I, and I think that depends on, on the book itself. I think if you get to know her personally, that, that makes a huge difference. But in the book, she's telling her point of view. And with any biography or book that you read nowadays, you have to understand that there is more than that story than just what's in the text. So kind of taking that and critical thinking a little bit it makes me kind of think she's very opinionated so uh what were your thoughts overall well let's take a step back and if anybody hasn't read the book yet it's really about uh shirley babishoff is uh was an american swimmer who swam at the munich uh, 1972 and Montreal 1976 games and she was breaking world records left and right but when it came to the games she just couldn't get gold and part of the problem was that she was going up against the East German doping machine and that country's systematic doping program uh, their swimmers were part of that program when it came time for Montreal where Babishoff could have gotten like a record six gold medal she dropped out of one of the events and then she kept losing to the East Germans and that's because of the doping. And then the last relay, the relay team worked really hard and really visualized their race. And then they won gold. So it was about her swimming career. And then also about like the issues she had facing the machine because the media, she called them out really quickly. She's like, Hey, these East Germans look like men. And the media did not like that. So they called Mm -hmm. her Surly Shirley and they said she was being a bad sport and she was very curt with the press. <laughs> and so she could have been America's sweetheart and just wasn't. And so that, that led to a very different life than what you could have had had this East German doping program not been in place. My first impression was there was too much story. I was very overwhelmed. Because on the one sense, she gave her whole life story. I mean, she started talking about her parents and the the struggles and the abuse that she suffered from her father and, and the emotional abuse she suffered from her mother. And she went straight through to today. Mm-hmm. And it felt like, are you trying to tell your story or are you trying to tell the 76 story? I mean, mm-hmm. obviously 76 was central to both her life and the book, but she kept kind of to me, sort of throwing in these bits, 
where that could have been a whole story unto itself. Mm -hmm. So I felt, and I think that maybe what you were feeling, Claire, of, I don't know if I would like this person, because it felt like she was telling so many different stories mm -hmm. that I was sort of overwhelmed by all the horrible things that happened and how she reacted to them. It was very revealing, like, to, to hear about her pretty horrible childhood, but to hear about it, I think that's what got me was, you know, she mentioned it and she mentioned how horrible it was, but then she, then she moves on and it's like, well, what happened? I mean, it, were there any ramifications from this? Eventually she comes back and kind of wraps it up, kind of, but there's so many things that there's so many layers and you, you kind of want to get the whole picture but she feels like she has to move on in order to get the full story. I think that's that's where I really struggled with this book was it kind of was a glaze over the story. It's like, oh, by the way, this happened. Wait, what? That ha what? Mm -hmm. it's, so there was and, a little of that. And it did seem like she didn't necessarily remember stuff very well. And maybe that's, you know, oh, because I was watching a bunch of video today. So there's one video on YouTube where she's, riding down uh riding her bicycle down the road and she's talking a little bit over it and she says oh i don't really remember munich 1972 because i was only 15 so this time i'm coming coming to the olympics for you know really going for a good shot at gold it's a jim mckay special comparing uh, about her and cornelia ender and it's really uh it's part of the olympics coverage there and it was really interesting because they analyzed their stroke bit by bit throughout the whole pool and it was great to see jim mckay again yeah. oh it was and it was it's just it's interesting to hear that oh i kind of don't remember this and i remember that and and i wonder how much how how difficult it was for chris epting to kind of put stuff together because in the beginning especially there's not a good sense of what the swimming world is like at this point there's like i'm going to this meet oh i'm going to that meet i'm going to this meet and swimming back then is very different from how it's organized today but i believe that one of fina's first world championships happened during her swimming career so yes, you know you, you have correct. this whole you had this whole evolution of how this the the sport is is taking place and these meets that are coming on board and I couldn't get a sense of what was important and what wasn't important. It just seemed like one day she's going to Texas for a meet and then the next day, which this did happen, the next day she's going over to Europe to swim, but it was just like, well, we went back to California, then we were in Africa or then we went to France, then we went here and then we went there. And I just couldn't get a sense of what was important and what wasn't in this time period for a swimmer. I wonder if her, you mentioned Chris Epting. I wonder if her co-author really struggled with her keeping him at arm's length. Because it felt like mm -hmm. the whole story, like you were saying, Claire, it was glazed. It felt like a lot of that early childhood and even her teenage years was at arm's length. Yeah. It was like when she was started talking about things that happened in the 80s and 90s, I felt like I was reading a different author. So you don't have the issue of having an abusive parent, you don't have the issue of being attacked by the press so that she's able to reflect on that time in a less compartmentalized way. Yeah. I think probably that, you know, the six, the, that sixties and seventies time, was it so compartmentalized in her brain that when she spoke about it, it came off as, because certainly in the book, it comes off very superficial. I don't feel like I know what she was like then, mm -hmm. but I do feel like I know what she's probably like now mm -hmm. when she was talking about, you know, when she was a, a poster worker and her feelings of the doping scandals and how people have come to her for comment now. And I don't think it was just because it was so long ago, because you would think your Olympic experience would be the most prominent memory and, and, and other Olympians we've talked to can tell us you know, day by day, minute by minute, things that happened from 76 and mm -hmm. from, you know, the 80s. I think that's something symptomatic of being an abuse survivor, that everything yeah. is pieced separately. Oh, I was going to say, um, 
not to interrupt you, but I was reading an article today from the New York Times just to see what was said about her in the press. And there's an article from July 15th, 1976 by Frank Litsky where he goes, when Miss Babishoff speaks in public, she seldom uses two sentences when one will do. When she was asked about which of her four freestyle races she liked, she answered with almost a speech. I like the 100 because it's short, but I don't like it because it's short. I like the 200 because it's a perfect distance. I like the 400 because I can go easy some of the time. I like the 800 because I can go easy most of the time. <laughs> you know, it's just that, like you say, does, did she compartmentalize stuff and not really... Obviously, they didn't have media training because she talked about how her sister got media training. and Through her videos. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? I love that. <laughs> Team USA is showing them, do not act like this. Oh, look, it's my sister. <laughs> Surprise. Exactly. So even I wonder if Chris Epting was doing his research and couldn't find anything great in the press to work with either to give him context to, to write a write a story that made you connect better. Right. And since she got such pushback from the press, she shut down as well. Mm -hmm. So once once she said that first thing in Montreal about, do you not see what's happening here? You know, she very early took one look at those East German girls and said, this isn't right. And she said it publicly. And after that, I don't think for the rest of the Olympics, you saw the real Shirley. Yeah. And so there is no record of, of what she was probably really like at that time. Going back to one of her previous books, when we did read the autobiography from Lopez Lomong, I could read it in his voice. Almost all of it. I know he, he had a ghostwriter that kind of helped him out as well. With this book, a lot of the early history, it was almost like, and then I went to this championship and then Chris Epting filled in like all of the newspaper worthy information. It's like, it happened here and it happened on these dates and these people were there. And it, you know, that seemed very much superficial where it, that wasn't actually Shirley that was saying that. I think a lot of the holes were filled in with just information pile up. You're right though, in, in the latter half of the book, it seemed like there was a lot less of that because it was kind of Shirley being able to be honest and, and reflect more on it. I, I am curious about your thoughts. I, Jill, especially, you mm-hmm. went to Montreal last year, I think it was, and yes. uh, toured around. Um, Swam in the pool. With all of your history on, on Montreal, mm-hmm. how did that line up with the things that you read? Uh, you know, I, I feel horrible about this. Um, I didn't know who she was, and I was an age group swimmer, and this would have been... A person for me to know it was right about the the prime I swam from like ages 8 to 12 and it was a big deal I, I went to swim camp she mentioned Indiana University Doc Councilman as the coach I went to his swim camps um I knew who that was and he was a big deal I knew I could name every male swimmer who was a big deal could not tell you who the female swimmers were from the 70s but I knew Mark Smith I knew John Neighbor I knew Gary Hall I knew all of them but the women did not know them, and I should have known who Shirley Babishoff was. So I think the first real female swimmer to enter my brain was Nancy Hogshead and Carrie 80, Steinseifer So from 84. 84 when they did the tie, when they had the tie in the 100 free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I feel, I feel really bad that I don't know who she was, and I'm not sure if that's because of how she was portrayed in the press or, or I mean, she won silvers. So she didn't win gold. So she wasn't like one of the golden ch- children. Cause we all knew who Nadia was, but we could have known she could have been a household name. She could have leveraged that for some fame. Although I don't, well, maybe without the doping, maybe cause she really, Alice and I talked a little bit about this. She really was, she's bitter. Oh man. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of bitterness in her. And even though she's happy where she is and she has a job she likes and a child she adores, you can just see how bitter she is from this whole episode. And rightfully so, and to be I was fair. I just going to say that, yes. To, to, to be fair, you know, from, from when we first spoke and, and I was doing my research on it, I would feel just as bitter as she does, I think. Mm-hmm. Because she did, you know, we've talked a lot about doping now and mm-hmm. athletes and the redress. And yes, a lot of those athletes do end up getting the medal that they should have gotten. Right. But, but it's lost, never the same. It's never the same because they lost commercial opportunities. They lost training money. 
you know, that would have been awarded mm-hmm. to them by their, their national organizations. And they just lost, you know, speaking fees and, you know, all those parades and just silly things that don't necessarily matter. And then a lot of people retire who might not have retired if it didn't happen. You know, would she have stuck around until 1980, which wouldn't have ended up mattering because of the boycott, if the doping hadn't happened? She was only 19. That's right. Yeah, I mean, that was, yeah, that's a good question. Although at the same time, you know, re- remember when John Neighbor told us, look, there was nothing because we couldn't, we were amateurs. And so what are you going to do unless she was in college, which didn't, wasn't a good fit for her? What what would you do? Or you got married to someone who could support your training. I I don't know. It's, right, it's really interesting. It's she sad. certainly I mean, lost out. She did. On... She should have been on a Wheaties box. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of it has to do with the time. Yeah. Mid seventies, mm-hmm. an outspoken woman mm-hmm. was shunned. And, you know, if you were a sweet young lady that ended up winning golds, then you were adored. But if you weren't, people didn't want to talk to you. It it's basically the reverse of what's going on now. We have outspoken um, female soccer players who are demanding equal pay and everybody is latching on to that and saying, of course they should. I mean, they've won more World Cup uh, championships than the, our men's teams have. So it, 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 it's very much the, the opposite of what we experience now. I, you very much have to put yourself in those shoes and say, well, because right now, when I look at this and I go, how dare they, you know, call her Surly Shirley for these things? You know, she was only speaking what she what she thought. But back then, people didn't want to hear that. And if they did, they thought you were strange or, you know, right. an anomaly. And, right. And the unsportsmanlike conduct that yeah. you have. You should, you know, it was almost like we were afraid of a communist country. Right. The, the whole idea of doping is in the zeitgeist now. In 1976, mm-hmm. it wasn't. No, no. And they probably didn't know what to do with it, too. And they were supposedly passing the tests. I don't know what those tests were. Let's be completely honest. Even the athletes didn't know what was going on. A lot of the the people that get uh, hit on doping today would say, oh, I didn't know. But to my knowledge, a lot of the East Germans had no idea what they were putting in their systems. And... You know, even if they asked, they were being lied to. So even for them experiencing this, it's not, I don't want to say it's not entirely their fault, but at the same time, who do you blame for this? You got to blame the government, the doctors for for putting those poor uh, people through Mm -hmm. these things. And I don't know, did you guys see the documentary? I think it was in 2016 they did a documentary about Shirley Babishoff and uh, they aired it during the Olympics, I think. Did you see that? No, I did not. I did not. I... The last gold? Yes. I actually watched it live uh, when, oh, okay. when they mentioned it. So I was kind of like, oh, I want to know about this. So that's where I first heard about Shirley Babishop. And like mm-hmm. first heard about her. I had no idea who she was before that. So that's what clued me in when all of a sudden somebody mentioned, oh, hey, we should read this book. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember that from that documentary yeah. I saw. And, you know, it's just seeing the repercussions of the East Germans, because they did interview a few of them and they were talking about their health struggles 40 years later, uh, what they've had to deal with. I think some of them had miscarriages and were really struggling. And, you know, you just feel for these women that had no sense of personal, they, they were betrayed by the people they were working for. And it just makes me feel rotten inside. <laughs> Right. And I'm, sure, I'm sure that Americans, like, they, they feel the same way. I'm sure that Shirley, I mean, yes, she was duped, but I don't think it's all on the swimmers. Sorry. No, that's okay. I mean, it's, I think it's interesting how she has petitioned to try to get the medals reassigned, and the IOC finally shut that down. But the fact that the East Germans won on a technicality, I guess you could say. They won because they were doping. But, you know, they also suffered and they were pawns in the system. So to almost take away those gold medals keeps adding insult to injury. Maybe mm-hmm. I take that out. But 
you well, know what I'm saying? About, like they talked about how Swimming Worlds had come up with a proposal to basically award two gold medals mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they were saying that the East German swimmers were as much victims of this situation as the women who lost, like Shirley Babishoff, who lost out on the medals. Because this is not a situation like Marion Jones and, and Ben Johnson, mm -hmm. who knew exactly yeah. what they were doing. Yeah. These right? girls had no clue and had no choice. Right. And what do you do when you see yourself looking more manlier and manlier and just like, well, I guess this is the way I'm developing? I question that a little bit. Okay. Because I was looking at some old film. Mm -hmm. And when you saw Cornelia Ender in 1976, she does not look all that different than the other swimmers. I would agree. She was, and they gave her statistics, the same height as Shirley Babishoff and mm -hmm. only eight pounds heavier. Right. So when I looked at her, I thought her body looked very different than swimmers do today. But in comparison to the other girls she didn't look that different no so you had to wonder if that was her true talent because she did like you see some of the other pictures of some of the other swimmers from the east german team and they are really very masculine looking that's true yeah and and i because i was very curious about cornelia ender too and it could be very well that she had that much talent all on her own and maybe who knows i don't i haven't been able to to dig into the East German government records and you know do they have you know they track stuff very well but do they have broken out like we're gonna give this person this and this person that and did they what did they give her right or did they give her anything and just say oh we're we're just training you I don't oh, know that would that would stink you know it's like Oh, we're we're gonna give you a placebo. You're doing well enough, but we have to make it look like you're taking drugs of some kind. Oh, I'm man, sure she was. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure she yeah, was, but maybe yeah. not to the extent. And also, extent, yeah. if her body was, you know, obviously, women's bodies have a, a very great variance. Mm -hmm. I don't think doping does anything to your height, even when given to somebody very, very young. I don't think it's going to make you grow taller. So her height was all her. Mm -hmm. And her, the question is, was her build? She probably would not have been that much smaller. Now, she recovered more quickly. She was able mm -hmm. to train there you longer. Go. Yes. She was able to do all those things. So I'm wondering if, and again, this is our sort of lack of knowledge of doping, which is good. It really didn't change her physique as much as it gave her other advantages. Right. It may have gov given her the ability to train like decades ahead of her time because we know so much more now about training and how to train properly and in cycles or do weight training and all that. that right. She was able to implement. Pro I don't know. It's a good question. You know what else? I, I don't want to forget to bring this up. One of the things, not just Shirley, Shirley's losing the gold medals and the other athletes who lost the gold. One thing I noticed about the list of athletes who should have been gold medalists were uh, some Canadians. And remember how Montreal was the first host city that never won a gold medal at their yeah. own Olympics? Yeah. So Thanks. it was just like, oh, that shouldn't have happened. And it was so disappointing to that country. That, Canada was crushed. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, the Canadians were crushed. When, and I know they talk about it when they do the tour at the, the Olympic Park in Montreal. Because mm -hmm. I went on it years and years ago, and you know it was probably in the '90s. And the person who gave the tour says, "And here's the flags of all the countries that won gold. The one flag you don't see." And she got teary eyed. Oh my goodness! And this was a girl who, trust me, was not alive in 1976. This still bothered them. Probably was about 30 years later. So that just that makes me even more mad than the Shirley Babishaw story mm -hmm. in a way. Sort of these ripples of the doping. Yeah, all the all the story trajectories you change for history with this one event. Yeah, but you don't hear about it. You hear about the Americans, you know, being loud about it because that's what Americans do. That's that's why we have a podcast that is loud and talks a lot about <laughs> stuff. So I guess that's just a thing. <laughs> There was one thing that, that really bothered me that I, I don't want to glaze over. 
it really bothered me that she kept referring to the women that competing against the women who were doping was like competing against men. And I think the reason that bothered me so much because of what we're dealing with right now with Castor Semenya. Mm. Mm. And you weren't competing against men because women can compete against men. We see it in other sports. They compete on equal footing in dressage. They, you know, we've seen where they've done mixed teams for uh, bobsled. You were competing against women who were cheating. And I wish she had used different language. Instead of keeping referring to these East German swimmers, it was like competing against men. You were competing against cheaters. And giving, that was giving the us issue. the unfair advantage in that yes. kind of way. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Because women can compete against men in some sports, not mm-hmm. necessarily in swimming, because obviously the elite times for men are faster than for women. Mm-hmm. She trained with men. She trained with men. I mean, we've seen lots of mixed teams and mixed relays. And the, that language really bothered me because I think that's what's bleeding into the Castor Semenya story, that she's not a real woman, that somehow she's cheating. And she's not cheating. She just is who she is. And it's not the same as what these East German women were doing. So that That's my soapbox. That really bothered me. No. Speaking of men and women and transgender, Bruce Jenner makes an appearance. Yeah, I know. As Bruce Jenner. <laughs> As Bruce Jenner, and appropriately so. I did think the Bruce Jenner and O.J. Simpson appearances <laughs> were just bizarre. She throws in these little anecdotes that she met them, and basically that they're both horrible people. And right rude and just unpleasant and i'm like and and the and then they went nowhere just like oh yeah. randomly oj wanted to speak to me in the stands like <laughs> i don't even know who oj is he didn't like that it I felt left. it felt like she was sort of saying i knew they were terrible people long before everybody else did and, and that's the same thing coming back to you got to make sure you understand everything which is a struggle now because what's fake, what's just put in a book to to get ratings and to sell copies, and what is actually truth? You really mm-hmm. have to you have to think critically with these kind of things. And this is the kind of the well, maybe the second book because uh, I read that what was it the the history of the Olympics or something like that, which was just oh the so, games oh yes oh that made my brain melt. Uh, and he was just so biased sometimes about things and. That's where I kind of said, "Oh, I gotta, I gotta read this with a grain of salt." And this was another book where it's like, "Well, I gotta, I gotta read this with a the full perspective." Definitely, and like that full perspective. One of the other things I I did I read about today was um, the it was so interesting when she said, "Oh, I didn't keep in touch with my relay team, even though they were really close then." And I will say, I really liked how that relay team thought about how they were I know I said this already but they thought about how they were going to perform and they did all this mental training before they actually went in the pool and that really helped them but uh 2016 was the first time since 1976 that the remaining three women had been in the same place and the uh the one of the the team members died of a a brain tumor Mm -hmm. hold on who was it? Oh, Kim Payton died of a brain tumor in 1986. And so in 2016, uh, someone got the other three together, and that was the first time they had been together. And the article said, mainly because Babishoff had resisted any reunion. Hmm. And she talks in this book about how they they mean a lot to her and how they get together, and it's just like old times or or that. And, and uh, one of the swimmers... Uh, uh, Boglioli remembered writing to each of them on the team in 1992 when the state doping program in the Easter in East Germany got revealed, and she was working on getting that support from the USOC to revisit the 1976 results. And she goes, "I received this letter back from Shirley. It was a two-page rant. She just felt cheated and robbed and heartbroken." And that's kind of what I feel that some there's an element of that to this book it's a a, it's a longer rant that's kind of i you know thank goodness she was working with a writer because i think if she wrote this on her own it would be very very angry 
And, and it, even the bitterness still comes through after all of that editing and, and inserting mm -hmm. of facts and information so you get the, uh, the context of it all. There's still a lot of bitterness. And, I mean, even the title, which we always pick books with incredibly long subtitles. My Journey to Winning <laughs> Olympic Gold and Defeating the East German Doping Program. I wonder who thought of that title. So it's, <laughs> it's interesting, you know, she could have just called it Surly Shirley's, you know, Sur Sur Surly no more or something like that. And, uh, or time to apologize, everybody, you, you, <laughs> you done messed up. <laughs> yeah. And, and we don't want to lose the fact that her message is true and she was right. Yes. And we might not like the way she delivers the message, but what happened to her and what happened to the other swimmers was wrong and they were robbed and they were cheated. And I'm saying this to myself because Jill and I had this conversation. It's not fair for us as spectators to tell her she shouldn't feel how she feels. That is true. You know, even though we may not like it and we may not want to have a cup of coffee with her and reading some of this book was unpleasant because of how angry and bitter she still is that's hers mm -hmm. and that's fair and I'm more honestly I'm telling myself this more than anybody because I was so frustrated with how bitter and angry she was and I didn't want her to be so bitter and angry I wanted her to rise above that and overcome it and she didn't and that made me mad at her which isn't fair it's a struggle and with this book I, I would say, you know, I was talking about, we've all been talking about our frustrations with it. Do I regret reading it? Absolutely not. I think a book like this needs to be read. It needs to be understood uh, so that we can understand her better, where she's coming from. Uh, so that when we look back at the past, we can see where these people have dealt with things like this. And we can kind of try to make it better for, for the people in the future that have to, that hopefully don't have to deal with this, but might have to. It's a, we don't want it to be a vicious cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I and would I, totally agree. I would totally recommend this book. It might push your buttons in a way that you don't want to be pushed, but it's an important story to tell an important piece of history to know and try to learn from. And unfortunately, the Olympic movement or aspects of the Olympic movement keep repeating that history, but maybe at some point we'll learn if we keep getting books like Shirley's out there or the message keeps getting repeated in different ways and more athletes speak up, maybe we can get a handle on it. Yep. I yeah. wonder, Shirley Babishoff talks a lot about the institutions and what the institutions should do, like WADA, like the IOC both to address grievances from the past and to better address doping right now. But I'm wondering, and I definitely do not have an answer to this, what do we as fans, what can we as fans do to help? What are we doing or are we doing something that's making either doping easier, doping more appealing, are we accepting these athletes too much at face value? Are we not being critical enough? Are we being too critical? I, I'm just, I want to, I want to throw that out there to say, is there something that we can do even on a one-to-one -one level to say, we all agree doping is wrong. We can't do anything about the system, but what can we do? What can we do? That's a good question, and I wonder if some of it is the emphasis on winning instead yeah. of just taking part because there's the the medal tables every night when you have the Olympics. Who's leading the medal table? Everybody wants the gold medal, and I, I mean, the, the taking part is a very important thing, and it's everybody's got a very hard journey to get to that level, and it's all valid, so maybe if we put more emphasis on that i don't i don't know because it's a very good question oh yeah it's a great question i i see us as americans being people that okay if an up-and-comer you know pops up and shows promise i'm i'm thinking in particular of this high schooler named matthew bowling 
who, you know, he's an amazing sprinter. Oh my gosh, he's amazing. Everybody freaks out about him and everybody wants to have the first say because they want, if he does become an amazing talent, they want to kind of say, oh yeah, I knew him way back when he first got started or with any famous gymnast or any famous swimmer that they see, they want to be first. I mean, wasn't that a thing on YouTube for a while? If, if a video posted and you got to be the first comment, you just put first. That's that's what people want in their lives in in social media. They they want to be the first to be able to to um, get onto something. And I think that comes here too. They don't think of it critically. They just want to be first. They just want to uh, appreciate them at base value and not look at any deeper. So I think yeah, that's what it's... we can do. Yeah, and and similarly to that, it's it's also the stories you see. I think particularly in local papers where, oh, we got a hometown talent. Mm. They're going for the Olympics in six years. And you're just like, you know, how many things could happen until then? And don't put that pressure on them now. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, like, it, it's that balance of I want to dream big and I need to vocalize my dreams so that I can and set those goals and make that happen and, and say that. But where does that flip into now you're fa you're feeling all this pressure because everyone expects you to be an Olympian? Yeah, I, I don't blame the athletes much for this. I blame everybody else, <laughs> which which includes <laughs> me, because we tend to put them on pedestals when they're just, you know, what what's the People magazine stars? They're just like us. Right. Here's, he's he's going to get toilet paper, and you know he's she's getting Starbucks, but that's it. They 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 are literally just us, except they're great athletes. So stop putting them on pedestals. Start seeing them as people like you and me that you can have a normal conversation with, and, and respect them for the talents they have, but don't idolize them. Which you know you can also blame marketing. Because, oh, mm -hmm. we're going to put them on posters. We're going to put them on Wheaties boxes. We're going to have NBC. We're going to have Mary Carillo come and interview you so we can do a sob story. And so that's the kind of thing that, that people tend to do. They The marketing puts them on pedestals. So the common people put them on pedestals. And all of a sudden, when they don't produce, we get angry at them. Well, we shouldn't. We don't deserve to do that. That's, mm -hmm. We don't have a right to do that. They are just people who are very talented. And the more we can appreciate them for who they are and respect them and treat them like you and them, you and me, then the better they'll be because they'll just be focused on their talent and not their marketing persona. And then I think the, the success and failure, you know, one of the, the things that Shirley Babishoff was punished for in a way was not winning those gold medals. She was supposed to, she was supposed to be right. the female Mark Spitz. Mm -hmm. This was supposed to be, you know, five, six gold medals. And she didn't. And she was viewed as a failure, even though she was breaking world records left and right, winning medals. She won bronzes and silvers. It wasn't like she went there and didn't swim her best. And yet she was punished for it. Yeah, this reminds me a lot of Michelle Kwan, you know, she competed in two Olympics and she was expected to medal. She was expected to win gold and she didn't. And I think if she had, she would have been everywhere. And instead, after the Olympics, she basically disappeared. And we remember her because, you know, because of the buildup. But after that, there was just, there was nothing. And even Tara Lipinski, you know, when she won the gold, now she is all over the place because she is Olympic gold medalist, Tara Lipinski. Right. And Michelle Kwan had more U.S. championships than anybody. Mm -hmm. Many, many world championships. I mean, this was probably the greatest female figure skater in history but she doesn't have that one thing. She does right. not have that gold right. medal. And so she's always that step below. And Shirley Which, Babishoff was definitely that same. She never had yeah. that gold, that individual gold medal. So she was never one of the greats. There's something that's big. The cultural difference between all of these athletes, when they talked about the East Germans they talked about how hidden they were, how they wouldn't practice with the others, how when somebody came in to practice, oh, where are the East Germans? Oh, they already came, they left. 
And that was just assumed to be part of the East German culture because that's how it was there. You didn't really know that much. And for the Americans, according to most Europeans, we are loudmouth Americans and just talk all the time and burgers and beer. And it's very much a, a cultural thing, too. I think that's where Shirley Babishoff struggled because they just kind of assume, oh, that's the loudmouth American. And they were like, oh, well, they'd be, here's the soft-spoken East Germans, except that they were kind of being told what to say and people mm-hmm. didn't realize it. So there is definitely a cultural thing that that people were struggling to deal with at that time that hopefully by now is starting to be understood by more people, maybe maybe not everybody, but, but more people understand, okay, this is a culture that they deal with in this way or, or something like that. I am so glad you mentioned burgers and beers because this, I, I don't want us to end without mentioning this. She swung the Olympic trials after she had an In-N-Out burger. That's amazing. It is I, amazing. I would have sunk to the bottom of the pool. <laughs> That's how you know she was good. Yep. Man, imagine if she had the whole diet thing going on. Yeah, forget- But she was swimming. How many thousands of yards was she swimming a day? I mean, she could eat whatever she wanted to. What was it, 20 20 miles? 20 miles. Yeah, yeah, 20 miles a day. They were talking about Michael Phelps' 10,000 calorie diet. Yeah, yeah, you can't eat enough. To eat the hamburger and then go into the pool, like, directly. Fuel for the fire. She did not wait 30 minutes before going into the pool after eating. Old wives' tale. I know. I sound like (laughs) an old lady, which is what I am. No comment. (laughs) (laughs) all righty claire what are we reading next time our next book is going to be another book that takes a look at a specific olympics and it's actually one that babishoff does mention in her book it's the 1972 olympics the title of the book is called munich 1972 tragedy terror and triumph at the olympic games it's written by david clay large and not only does it look at the terrorist attack but it also looks at the athletes that had the spotlight on them uh, at the olympics for example mark spitz winning his seven gold medals which lasted for a pretty long time before getting broken so i i urge everybody to to pick up a copy and take a look at that and because there's a couple other things that that might be running up right up against that book that are related so if you want to stay tuned for that Definitely should look into it. Thank you so much, Claire. Our next book will be Munich 1972, Tragedy, Terror, and Triumph at the Olympic Games by David Clay Large. And we will have a link to it on our book club page at olimfever.com. And don't forget if that if you click through the link and purchase your book through Amazon, we'll get a little commission on that purchase. And that greatly supports the efforts of this show. I'm very excited about reading about Munich. I am too, because this is before I, I remember. Right. And we will have our next book club meeting sometime in November. Moving on to some IOC news. Former governor of Rio de Janeiro State is alleging that they bribed some of the IOC members in order for Rio 2016 to win that bid. The governor's already jailed for bribing, so who knows what's right. A couple of the members they claim to have bribed were Sergei Bupka and Alexander Popov, who, of course, are denying this, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. I don't It It was disappointing. Right. So basically, a criminal is saying he did criminal things with other criminals. Oh, but also these other guys, because, you know, I'm not going down by myself. Yeah, could be. Don't know. Coincidentally, the IOC also just signed a memorandum of understanding with the OECD, which is the um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And so they want to promote ethics integrity and good governance and they're going to work together with uh, the OECD on that. Interesting timing. We'll see what happens. Don't know who to believe at this point, but that's so that what's happening. the 2016 the the awarding of 2016 would have happened in 2009, which was before Thomas Bach and right. all his push to revamp 
the bid process. Right. This so is unfortunately com- a Jacques Rogue. Thing. Right. So to come out with these allegations now, 10 years later, I don't think is actually, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, I think it's unfair to the IOC. Because Bach has, as much as we make fun of T. Bach and this whole bid process, I give him a lot of credit for trying to turn the Titanic of trying to make changes to the bid process. All right, let's move on to Tokyo 2020. The Tokyo Organizing Committee has announced their one year to go events. They have a whole bunch of stuff going on. The actual one year to go ceremony is by invitation only, but there's other stuff happening in the city that you can look at. It's at the tokyo2020.org website. They have this initiative coming out called Let's Five Five, which five in Japanese is go. So it's let's go go. And so they're going to talk about the 55 sports in the program, in the Olympic and Paralympic program. Oh, how clever. Isn't it, isn't it cute? Yeah, 55 sports in the Olympic and Paralympic program. So they're going to have a big event where you can get to know the sports that's on wednesday july 24th from 10 to 6 in the tokyo international forum plaza and then they're also going to have online if you follow them they're going to have little one minute videos of every sport there's also a little exhibit called in uh nihonbashi city area which is going to be called feel 2020 which is going to talk about how to dress so this will feel uh what do you mean how to dress? Um, we are organizing an event to bring the heat and excitement of the games a year in advance to the Nihombashi area. The visuals will feature athletes, spectators, and images of the overall support toward the games. The spectator ambiance of the c- competition venues will be recreated in the Nihombashi area. Come and experience the games now. Huh. So it's like a test event for spectators. I, I guess so. Because, <laughs> you know, we have to practice. That's right. And I'm, it's going to be hot. So, yeah, I'm going to go sit on my couch when we're done and make sure that it is properly positioned. <laughs> be my test event. <laughs> Listeners, you, you also, if you are working through your test events for watching the games next year, let us know. We want to know. We want to know your optimal setups for how many screens are you going to have? Are you going to have them going all at the same time? Where are your snacks going to be? Are you thinking about snacks? Yeah. Oh, I, let's do a let's do a thing on social media where okay. one year out, people should post their their, their test, test event. event. Oh yeah, I love it. Their spectator test event. You know, right? their proper because there's gear you have to wear. The right, you know, what do you normally wear? Where do you position yourself? I want to see everybody's spectator. I do. Event. And if you have recipes, maybe we can put together Olympic Fever cookbook and uh, Chef Ben can uh, make those on his Insta feed. I will try to make the, uh, the, I've been threatening to make the Olympic ring jello molds. Yes. I think this is it. I'll need to test it out. All right. That sounds good. You can send us your recipes either. You can post them on our podcast Facebook group, or you can email them to us at info at olimfever.com or olimfever at gmail.com, whatever works best for you. The other thing that Tokyo 2020 is doing with One Year to Go is unveiling the metal designs. So that will be super exciting to see. And they've announced that they've achieved their goals with all of the metal that they needed to collect and refine. And the Kyoto News was reporting that the collection process generated 32 kilograms of gold, 3,500 kilograms of silver, and 2,200 kilograms of copper. That and was so, that whole project was amazing. I, yeah, it was so cool. And now they're doing the same thing with the plastic, with the podiums yes, and yes. some of the others. So, so I love that whole process of them recycling. You know, they're talking so much about sustainability and then putting it into a very public, prominent position, like the metals and the podiums are all recycled materials. Right. And using, and and if you as an average person give them a phone to recycle or something electronic or plastics to recycle, like you have a part in making that happen. And that's really neat. And, you know, talking about your test events, if you are on the lookout for 
what you should wear, you can shop our Olympic Fever merch store. Our store, you can find the link on our website at olimfever.com or you can shop directly at tpublic.com slash stores slash olimfever. We've got a bunch of new designs and you can get t-shirts, you can get other, you can get mugs, you can probably get some glasses. So if you need something to drink out of, we can make for that your happen test for event. You. Yes, you're gonna need some early morning coffee, I'm sure, or tea. T- uh, definitely tea, and then maybe some late night sake. There, there, there you go. <laughs> I'll have to test that event as well. <laughs> Let's move on to our Team Olympic Fever update. Tofu, happy tofu, busy tofu. Busy My tofu. Goodness. Yes, we have some world championships going on uh, right now. Uh, the FINA Artistic Swimming World Championships begins on July 12th in Korea, and our artistic swimmer Jacqueline Simino will be competing in solo and duet, and as part of the Team Canada team competition. I'm excited for her. She has been having such a great season so far, and it's just. I, I want her to win. I know. How do you say swim well in French? I don't, I don't know. Because I'm, 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 I'm sending her such good vibes. I want her to do so well. Go, Jacqueline. We'll be looking forward to seeing how you do. Our Team Olympic Fever ice hockey referee, Jessica LeClerc, is doing Maine's Try for a Cure this weekend to raise money for cancer fighting efforts. We'll have a link to her fundraising page in the show notes. So uh, she's done this event before and raised a bunch of money and it's really cool that she's doing it again. So go Jessica. And I hope you raise a bunch of money for uh, cancer research. Our team Olympic fever speed skater, Aaron Jackson is competing in the roller world games right now and she is doing a inline speed track she has been the top american finisher but the i, I will say south american countries like colombia is just are just really really strong in inline uh skating so uh she's had a lot of tough competition she got 12th in the 500 meter inline speed track event and 17th in the 200 meter so i don't like to comment on women's bodies in mm-hmm. general mm-hmm. but i do want to say when i was looking at the pictures of aaron jackson mm-hmm. as compared to how she looked at pyong chang mm-hmm. she looks more like a speed skater now oh really Is she i getting... see the different even though she was inline skating in this just looking at her body Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you, you've been training on the ice a lot longer, <laughs> which is actually kind of exciting to see. I know she's been working so hard on it. I definitely could see like, okay, you're, those clap skates are, are working for you. Good luck uh, to Aaron, and we'll be keeping an eye out on your progress. And then Kim Rohde is competing in the World Shooting Championships in Italy, and she got a silver in mixed skeet with Christian Elliott, and she's competing in single skeet as we tape. Uh, We want to take a second to thank all of our Patreon patrons because it does take a good 20 to 25 hours to put a show together, and our patrons really help us in providing the financial support, not just for the elements of the show that cost money, but also for the time we put in. So if you believe in the show and would like to support our efforts, please visit patreon.com slash olinfever, and we have patron levels for a variety of budgets, and some levels include bonus tape. Very cool. if you can't get enough of us, right. we'll give you more. Or our guests. We... That's true. Okay. On that note, we will wrap it up for this week, and we'll catch you back here next week for more Olympic stories. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. Stay in touch. Email us at olimfever at gmail.com. That's O-L-Y-M fever at gmail. You can also leave us a voicemail at 530-763-3837. That's 530-70-FEVER. We're on Twitter at Olim Fever, and you can join in the conversation at our Facebook group, Olympic Fever Podcast. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. You can't legislate against bad manners.